In 1942, while the world's skies thundered with Spitfires, Messerschmitts, and Zeros, the United States Army Air Forces introduced an aircraft that seemed like a cruel joke. It was stubby, underpowered, and by many pilots' accounts, a death trap. Officially, it was the Bell P-39 Aracabra, but in barracks and hangars across the Pacific and European theaters, it earned a crueler nickname, the Flying Coffin. Its engine sat behind the pilot, an unorthodox design meant to improve aerodynamics and armament balance, but instead it produced dangerous vibrations and handling quirks. The mid-engine layout demanded a long drive shaft under the cockpit floor, which unnerved every man who flew it. Many said it was like sitting atop a spinning spear. The Aracabra's service ceiling barely scratched 12,000 feet, while Luftwaffe interceptors hunted comfortably above 25,000. Its Allison engine gasped in thin air, forcing pilots to fight low and fast, often too low to survive a hit. American and British flyers condemned it as obsolete before it even met the enemy. Britain canceled its orders, France surrendered before delivery. Even American commanders quietly shifted focus to the P-40 and the new P-38 Lightning. And yet, thousands of P-39s kept rolling off assembly lines in Buffalo, New York. The reason wasn't pride or politics, it was strategy. The aircraft was cheap, rugged, and available when the U.S. desperately needed numbers. While America's best designs were reserved for Europe, the worst fighter was shipped to allies fighting for survival. The Soviet Union in particular accepted it by the hundreds under Lend-Lease. On the Eastern Front, something unexpected happened. In the hands of Russian pilots fighting low-altitude dogfights over Stalingrad, the Aracabra began earning kills and respect. Its heavy 37 cannon shredded German bombers at close range. For the first time, the worst fighter showed signs of becoming something else entirely, a survivor. The stage was set for redemption, but no one yet imagined it would one day shoot down a jet. Bell Aircraft's engineers never set out to make a graceful fighter. They wanted a fast gun platform, a machine that could tear through bombers, not dance with fighters, but their ambitions collided with physics. The Aracabra's mid-engine design placed its center of gravity behind the pilot, creating unpredictable stalls and vicious spins. Pilots learned to respect it the hard way, one mistake in a turn and it would flip like a thrown hammer, yet there was genius buried in its flaws. The P-39's nose cannon, a 37 monster firing through the propeller hub, packed the kind of punch that could obliterate an enemy aircraft with a single hit. Its tricycle landing gear, a first for American fighters, made it remarkably stable on takeoff and landing. For ground crews operating from rough airstrips, that meant fewer accidents and faster turnarounds. Larry Bell and his team at the Bell Aircraft Corporation refused to give up on their vision. They pushed for refinements, streamlining the fuselage, improving the cockpit visibility and experimenting with superchargers to fix its high-altitude suffocation problem. But wartime urgency forced compromises. Production had to continue, flaws and all. When test pilots compared it to newer aircraft like the P-47 Thunderbolt or P-51 Mustang, the Aracabra looked ancient. It lacked range, altitude and climb rate. On paper, it was already obsolete. But the Soviets, locked in brutal, low-level warfare, saw something Americans didn't, a plane built for their style of combat. In the hands of Red Air Force pilots, the Aracabra's weaknesses became assets. Dogfights over the steppe rarely rose above 10,000 feet. There the Allison engine breathed freely, and the cannon's brutal recoil barely mattered. Soviet ace Alexander Pokrishkin racked up 59 confirmed kills, many in an Aracabra. Tactic was simple, attack fast, fire once and dive away before the enemy could respond. The aircraft that American pilots mocked became one of the most feared machines on the Eastern Front. Reports flowed back to Washington astonishing kill ratios, growing Soviet enthusiasm. The brass began to reconsider. Maybe the Aracabra wasn't a failure, maybe it had simply been misunderstood. Its legacy was about to evolve again into a design that would break the limits of speed and enter the jet age. By 1943, Bell engineers were already sketching the Aracabra's successor. The lessons learned from its dangerous mid-engine layout and its close-range fighting style led directly to the next step in America's experimental lineage, the P-63 Kingcabra. It was faster, cleaner, and deadlier, but by then, another revolution was underway, jet propulsion. The Germans had already unleashed the Mi-262, the world's first operational jet fighter, and it terrified Allied pilots. Twice the speed, four times the climb rate, and armed with 13 cannons capable of shredding bombers, the Mi-262 seemed invincible. But like all technology, it was vulnerable during its birth. Early jets struggled with takeoffs, engine reliability, and fuel shortages. The Allies knew that catching them in those moments was the only way to bring them down. 
America's worst fighter, ironically, had paved the way for the aircraft that would do it. From the Aracabra's flawed core came a completely new idea, the P-80 Shooting Star. Designed by Lockheed's engineering genius Clarence Kelly Johnson, the P-80 borrowed lessons from every mistake the P-39 had taught, a streamlined fuselage, a centralized center of gravity. A tricycle landing gear strong enough to handle new jet speeds, and most importantly, stability at altitude. When test pilot Tony Levere first took the P-80 aloft in 1944, he described the sensation as finally catching the future. It wasn't just fast, it was smooth, precise, and controllable. Every pilot who had cursed the Aracabra's spin found redemption in the shooting star's grace, but combat doesn't wait for perfection. Before the P-80 could prove itself, another American fighter, built by North American Aviation, was already dueling German jets in the skies over Europe. The P-51 Mustang, America's most celebrated prop-driven fighter, had the speed, range, and altitude to hunt the Mi-262 during its most vulnerable moments. In one of the most dramatic air duels of the war, the unthinkable happened. A piston-engine fighter, one many had once dismissed as outdated, brought down a German jet. It was a moment that rewrote the rules of aerial combat and marked the beginning of America's dominance in the jet age. The story of that kill and the pilot who made it would transform ridicule into legend. It was November 8, 1944, deep over occupied Europe. Lieutenant Urban Ben Drew of the 375th Fighter Squadron banked his P-51 Mustang, Detroit Miss, toward a shimmering flash ahead. He thought it was sunlight glinting off aluminum, then it moved fast. Two silver shapes streaked through the haze at nearly 550 miles an hour. German Mi-262s, the world's first jet fighters. Drew had heard the rumors, they were untouchable, immune to prop-driven pursuit. But when one of the jets slowed to line up an attack on a formation of B-17 bombers, Drew saw his chance. He shoved the throttle forward, engine screaming as the Merlin roared past Redline. The Mustang quivered, airframe straining, but it held. The Mi-262's pilot focused on his target, too confident, too early in this new age. Drew closed the gap from above, sighted in, and fired a burst. Tracers slashed through the exhaust trail. The jet shuddered, smoke poured from its left engine, and seconds later it erupted into flame. The first jet ever destroyed in combat by what the world had once called an obsolete fighter. Moments later, another Mi-262 tried to climb away. Drew stayed on it, forcing the Mustang higher, ignoring the warning lights dancing on his dashboard. At 24,000 feet, he fired again. Another explosion, two jets in one mission. When he landed, his gun cameras had failed, and for months his claim went unconfirmed. Only after the war did German records validate both kills. The irony was staggering. The same aviation culture that had mocked the Aracabra's primitive experiments had produced the pilot and plane capable of defeating the future. America's so-called worst fighter had laid the mechanical groundwork and the mental resilience for the first generation of jet hunters. The P-51 wasn't just a machine. It was the culmination of every lesson learned from those early missteps. Its long-range escort role, laminar flow wing, and high-altitude power made it a bridge between eras. The piston age was ending, but it wouldn't go quietly. That single dogfight symbolized a transfer of power not just from one aircraft to another, but from skepticism to supremacy. The jet age had arrived, and America had entered it with guns blazing. Urban Drew's victory was more than a combat success. It was a statement of adaptation. The Germans had introduced technology no one had faced before, yet the Americans used experience, instinct, and grit to bridge the gap. The Mi-262 speed was terrifying, but it couldn't turn sharply or sustain fire for long. Its jet engines needed long runways, careful throttling, and time to spool up. The P-51s, guided by pilots like Drew, exploited those vulnerabilities mercilessly. At Y-29, Ash, and over the Rhine, Allied airmen developed tactics specifically to catch jets. They loitered above airfields at high altitude, waiting for Mi-262s during takeoff or landing when their speed advantage vanished. Prop-driven Mustangs, Lightnings, and Thunderbolts became predators again. Their mission wasn't just to protect bombers, it was to hunt jets before they could rewrite air power. Every Allied pilot knew the stakes. A single Mi-262 could obliterate a bomber formation in minutes. But every time a piston fighter brought one down, it proved something deeper. Technology alone couldn't win wars. The pilot, the training, the doctrine, those still mattered. And that was where America excelled. Urban Drew's triumph soon spread through squadrons like wildfire. His feat was sighted in briefings and radio chatter across the 8th Air Force. If a Mustang could kill a jet, nothing was invincible. Morale soared even as winter closed in. 
The Mustang, once doubted for its range and fragility, was now the most feared machine over Europe. Ironically, its roots traced straight back to America's worst fighter. The same mid-engine layout that doomed the Aracabra had forced designers to rethink aerodynamics, power distribution, and pilot visibility. The P-51's perfect balance, its inline engine, and its bubble canopy were direct answers to those early design failures. In failure lay innovation. When the U.S. entered the jet era months later with the P-80 shooting star, the lessons of the Aracabra and the courage of pilots like Drew had already laid the foundation. America had proven that even a so-called obsolete design could change the course of history when guided by ingenuity and willpower. The first jet kill wasn't luck, it was evolution, forged in aluminum and persistence. When the guns finally fell silent in 1945, the sky was no longer ruled by propellers. Jet thunder replaced the growl of piston engines and the world's air forces scrambled to define a new era. But beneath the polished metal of every shooting star, saber, and phantom lay the DNA of the aircraft once called America's worst fighter. The Bell P-39 Aracabra, flawed and feared, had forced U.S. designers to confront the limits of conventional thinking. Its mid-engine layout, its nose cannon, and its tricycle landing gear, all radical in 1941, became blueprints for the next generation. Even the Lockheed P-80 shooting star, America's first operational jet, borrowed the Aracabra's undercarriage geometry and cockpit ergonomics almost directly. The line between failure and innovation had never been thinner. For the pilots who survived its early days, the Aracabra's redemption was bittersweet. Many had buried friends who never mastered its temper, yet they also knew what it had taught them. It demanded precision, discipline, and respect, qualities that later defined the jet fighter era. It was, in a sense, the crucible of the modern pilot. Urban Ben Drew lived to see that transformation. Years after his two Mi-262 kills were officially confirmed, he watched the jets of the Cold War scream across the same European skies where his Merlin once roared. When asked what it felt like to shoot down the first jet, he said quietly, it wasn't the Mustang, it was every lesson that got us there. Today, the P-39 stands restored in museums, no longer mocked as a flying coffin, but honored as a stepping stone to the future. Its story reminds us that progress rarely starts with perfection, it begins with imperfection, refined through courage. From the swamps of New Guinea to the frozen fields of Stalingrad, and finally to the jet-filled skies over Germany, America's so-called worst fighter carved an unexpected legacy. It proved that failure can teach faster than success, that resilience builds more than machines, it builds generations. The Aracabra didn't win the war alone. But it shaped the mines and metal that would dominate every sky afterward. Its greatest victory wasn't over the enemy, it was over doubt itself.